I think it's very important to distinguish between facts, opinions, and beliefs. So I'm going to try very hard to be crystal clear when I am presenting facts versus stating opinion or communicating my beliefs. So let me be right up front about this. I hold three beliefs, which I'm going to share with you, and then spend the rest of our time showing you how I got to these beliefs. The first is that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. And why is this important? Because we tend to base our view of the future on our most recent experience. That's just part of being a human. It's also a gigantic liability at key turning points. So I say that massive change is already upon us. When I first gave this material as a talk three years ago, I used to say massive change is coming. Well, it's here now. That much is completely obvious. And the belief I hold is that it's really just getting underway. And I'm going to show you why I believe that. Next, I believe that it is possible, possible that the pace and or scope of change could overwhelm the ability of our key social and support institutions to adapt. Katrina taught us that a major U.S. city could be wiped out and pretty much remain that way for years. That is an example of major change occurring faster than our ability as a nation to respond. The types of changes I foresee in our economic landscape are much larger than Katrina. My third belief is that we do not lack any technology or understanding necessary to build ourselves a better future. Rather, we only lack the political will, which is really a reflection of the fact that we the people have not yet raised our voices in unison for real, substantive change. So the good news is that we already have everything we need, and the bad news is that we might not deploy it fast enough. Remember, these are simply my beliefs right now, and I reserve the right to change them if new information suggests that they are wrong. In the crash course, we will learn a few foundational key concepts. None are more important than exponential growth. Understanding this will greatly enhance our chances to form a better future. Here's a classic chart displaying exponential growth, a chart pattern that is often called a hockey stick. We are charting an amount of something over time. The only requirement for a graph to end up looking like this is that the thing being measured grows by some percentage over each increment of time. The slower the percentage rate of growth, the greater the length of time we need to chart in order to visually see this hockey stick shape. Another thing I want you to take away from this chart is that once an exponential function turns the corner, even though the percentage rate of growth might remain constant and possibly quite low, the amounts do not. They pile up faster and faster. In this particular case, you are looking at a chart of something that historically grew at less than 1% per year. It is world population, and because it is only growing at roughly 1% per year, we need to look at several thousands of years to detect this hockey stick shape. The green is history, and the red is the most recent UN projection of population growth for just the next 42 years. Certainly by now, math-minded folks might be getting a little uncomfortable because they might feel I'm not presenting this information in a classical or even very accurate way. Where mathematicians have been trained to define exponential growth in terms of the rate of change, we are going to focus on the amount of change. Both are valid, it's just that one way is easier to express as a formula, and the other way is easier for most people to intuitively grasp. Unlike the rate of change, the amount of change is not constant. It grows larger and larger with every passing unit of time, and that's why it's more important for us to appreciate than the rate. This is such an important concept that I will dedicate the next chapter to illustrating it. Also, 
Mathematicians would say that there's no turn the corner stage of an exponential chart because this is just an artifact of where we draw the left hand scale. That is, an exponential chart can nearly always look like a hockey stick at every moment in time as long as we adjust the left axis properly. But if we know the limits or boundaries of what we are measuring, then we can fix the left axis and the turn the corner stage is absolutely real and vitally important. For example, the total carrying capacity of the Earth for humans is thought to be somewhere in this zone, give or take a few billion. Because of this, the turn the corner stage is very real and not an artifact of graphical trickery. The critical takeaway for exponential functions, the one thing I want you to recall, relates to the concept of speeding up. You can think of the key feature of exponential growth either as the amount that is added growing larger over each additional unit of time, or you can think of it as the time shrinking between each additional unit of amount added. Either way, the theme is speeding up. To illustrate this using population, if we started with 1 million people and set the growth rate to a measly 1% per year, we'd find that it would take 694 years before we achieved a billion people. But we'd be at 2 billion people after only 100 more years while a third billion would require just 41 more years, then 29 years, then 22, and then finally only 18 years to add another to bring us to 6 billion people. That is, each additional billion people took a shorter and shorter amount of time to achieve. Here we can see the theme of speeding up. This next chart is of oil consumption, perhaps the most important resource of them all, which has been growing at the much faster rate of nearly 3% per year, so we can detect the hockey stick shape over the course of just 150 years. And here too, we can fix the left axis with some precision, because we know with reasonable accuracy how much oil the world can maximally produce. So again, having turned the corner is an extremely relevant and important event to us. And here's the U.S. money supply, which has been compounding at incredible rates, ranging between 5 and 18 percent per year. So this chart only needs to be a few decades long to see this hockey stick effect. And here's worldwide water use, species extinction, fisheries exploited, and forest cover lost. Each one of these is a finite resource, as are many other critical resources, and quite a few are approaching their limits. And here is the world you live in. If it seems like the pace of change is speeding up, well, that's because it is. You happen to live at a time when humans will finally have to confront the fact that our exponential money system and resource use will encounter hard physical limits. And behind all of this, driving every bit of every graph, is the number of people on the surface of the planet. Taken one at a time, any one of these charts could command the full attention of every earnest person on the face of the planet. But we need to understand that they are, in fact, all related and interconnected. They are all compound graphs and they are all being driven by compounding forces. To try and solve one, you need to understand how it relates to the other ones that you see, as well as others not displayed here, because they all intersect and overlap. The fact that you live here, in the presence of multiple exponential graphs relating to everything from money to population to species extinction, has powerful implications for your life and the lives of those who will follow you. It deserves your very highest attention. Let's move on to an example that will help you better understand these graphs. Please join me for Chapter 4, 
compoundings the problem. Thank you for listening. Now I'm going to introduce the second key concept, and it's far enough outside of the mainstream that I'm going to get a little backup from a 19th century philosopher. Here's the quote. All truth passes through three stages. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. Third, it is accepted as being self-evident. This great quote comes from this happy guy down in the corner. At some point over the next 20 years, this next concept I'm about to introduce will be self-evident. But for now, I think it would be safe to say that a lot of people would consider it to be ridiculous. And it centers around growth. Growth is good, right? We all want a growing economy, I guess. Why? Well, because a growing economy means that we're becoming more prosperous. Growth offers opportunities, and we're all for opportunities. At least I am. And this is the dominant story of our day. So many people would say that growth equals prosperity. But is this actually true? And what if it's not? Growth is actually a consequence of surplus, if we think about it. For example, our bodies only grow if they have a surplus of food. With an exact match between calories consumed and calories burned, a body neither gains nor loses weight. A pond only grows deeper if more water is flowing in than is flowing out, so it can be said that growth is actually dependent on surplus. Similarly, prosperity is dependent on surplus. Here's another example. Imagine that you are a family of four, your yearly income is $40,000, and at the end of the year, there is no money left. At the end of the year, there are zero extra dollars. But then a 10% raise comes along, which equals $4,000, and your family can either afford to have one more child, or you can enjoy additional prosperity by spending a little bit more on each person. But you can't do both. There is only enough surplus money in this example to do one thing, so you have to choose. Will it be growth, or will it be additional prosperity? And what is true in this example for a family of four is equally true for a town, a state, a country, and yes, our entire world. Through this example, we can tease out a very simple and utterly profound concept, that growth does not equal prosperity. For the past few hundred years, we've been lulled into linking the two concepts because there was always sufficient surplus energy that we could have both growth and prosperity. That is, we didn't have to make any hard choices between the two. The economist Malcolm Slessor of the Resource Use Institute of Edinburgh, Scotland, has calculated that over half of the world's energy is now used to simply grow. So here's the question. What's going to happen when 100% of our surplus money or energy is being used to simply grow? The result is going to be stagnant prosperity. And what happens if there's not enough surplus to even fund growth alone? Well, when that time comes, we will experience both negative growth and negative prosperity, not exactly the sort of future that I'm looking forward to. This, then, is the greatest challenge of our times, properly recognizing where we want our remaining surplus to go and getting that story out. I, for one, want to see continued advances in energy efficiency and medical technology and everything else that modern society can offer. This is what we place at risk if we allow ourselves to do what is easy, that is, take the path of least resistance and simply grow, instead of doing what is right, which is directing our surplus towards a more prosperous future. So there it is, key concept number two, growth does not equal prosperity. Now that you have these two in hand, we're ready to explore this thing called money. Before we begin our tour through the economy, the environment, and energy, we need to share a common understanding of money. Money is something that we live with so intimately on a daily basis, 
that it has probably escaped our close attention. Money is an essential human creation, and were all money to disappear, a new form of money would spontaneously arise in its place, such as uh, cows, tobacco, bread, a certain type of nut husk perhaps, or even nautilus shells. Without money, the complex job specializations that we have today would not exist because barter is so cumbersome and constraining. More importantly, though, is the concept that each type of money system has its pros and cons. Each will enforce its own peculiar outcomes by promoting some behaviors while suppressing others. Now, if we crack open a textbook, we'll find that money should possess three characteristics. The first is that it should be a store of value. Gold and silver have filled this role perfectly because they were rare, took a lot of human energy to mine, and did not corrode or rust. By contrast, the U.S. dollar pretty much constantly loses value over time, a feature which punishes savers and enforces the need to speculate. A second feature is that money needs to be widely accepted within a population as an intermediary within and across all economic transactions. And the third feature is that money needs to be a unit of account, meaning that the money must be divisible and each unit must be equivalent. The U.S. unit of account is the dollar. Diamonds have much value but are not good at being money because they are not perfectly equivalent to each other and dividing causes them to lose value. That is, they fail at being a unit of account. Blah, blah, blah. So what is money really? I believe it has a very simple definition. Money is a claim on human labor. With a very few minor exceptions, pretty much anything you can think of that you might spend your money on will involve human labor to bring it there. I say it's a claim on labor rather than a store of labor because the human labor in question might have happened in the past or it might not have happened yet. The concept of money being a claim on human labor is important, and we'll be building on it later, especially when we get to debt. As implied in the pictures earlier, literally anything can be considered money. Cows, bread, shells, tobacco. A U.S. dollar, like all modern currencies, however, is an example of a type of money called fiat money. Fiat is a Latin word meaning let it be done. And fiat money has value because a government decrees that it does. And this brings us to the key question, what exactly is a U.S. dollar? Once a dollar was backed by a known weight of silver or gold of intrinsic value. In this example, we can see the dollar came from the U.S. Treasury and was backed by a given amount of silver that was payable to the bear upon demand. Of course, that was back in the 1930s, and those days are long gone. Now dollars are the liability of an outfit called the Federal Reserve, a private entity entrusted to manage the U.S. money supply and empowered by the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 to perform this vital function. You'll note that modern dollars have no language entitling the bearer to anything, and that's because they're no longer backed by anything tangible. Rather, the value of a dollar comes from this language right here, the fact that it is illegal to refuse to accept dollars for payment, and that Federal Reserve notes are the only acceptable form of payment for taxes. It is crucially important that a nation's money supply is carefully managed, for if it is not, the monetary unit can be destroyed by inflation. In fact, there are over 3,800 past examples of paper currencies that no longer exist. These are numerous examples from the United States, which may have some collector value, but no longer possess any monetary value. Of course, I could just as easily display beautiful but no longer functional examples from Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia, and a hundred other places. How does the hyperinflationary destruction of a currency happen? Here's a relatively recent example that comes from Yugoslavia between the years 1988 and 1995. Pre-1990, the Yugoslavian dinar, seen here, had measurable value. You could actually buy something with one. However, throughout the 1980s, the Yugoslavian government ran a persistent budget deficit and printed money to make up the shortfall. By the early 1990s, 
the government had used up all its own hard currency reserves, and they proceeded to loot the private accounts of citizens. In order to keep things moving along, successively larger bills had to be printed, finally culminating in this stunning example, a 500 billion dinar note. At its height, inflation in Yugoslavia was running at over 37% per day, and this meant that prices were doubling every 48 hours or so. Let me see if I can make this a bit more concrete for you. Suppose that on January 1st, 2007, you had a penny, and you could find something to buy with it. At 37% per day inflation, by April 3rd, 2007, you'd need one of these, a billion dollar bill to purchase the very same item. Stated in reverse, if you had a billion dollars on January 1st stuffed in a suitcase, by April 3rd, you'd have had a penny's worth of purchasing power left. Clearly, if you'd attempted to save money during this period of time, you'd have lost it all. So we can safely state that inflationary money regimes impose a penalty on savers. The opposite side of this is that inflationary money regimes promote spending and require that money be invested or even speculated with so as to at least have the chance of keeping pace with inflation. Of course, investing and speculating involve risks, so we can broaden this statement to include the claim that inflationary money systems require the citizens living within them to subject their hard-earned savings to risk. Now that's worth pondering for a minute or two. Even more importantly, since history shows how common it is for currencies to be mismanaged, we need to keep a careful eye on the stewards of our money to make sure they are not being irresponsible by creating too much money out of thin air and thereby destroying our savings, our culture, and institutions in the process. Wait a minute. Did I just say creating money out of thin air? Yes. Yes, I did. This is such an important process to your, our, my future that we're going to spend the next two sections learning how money is created. If you're ready, proceed on. Now we're going to discover where money is created. The process works like this. Suppose Congress needs more money than it has. I know, that's a stretch. Perhaps it's done something really historically foolish, like um, cutting taxes while conducting two wars at the same time. Now, Congress doesn't actually have any money, so the request for additional spending gets passed over to the Treasury Department. You may be surprised, or dismayed, or perhaps neither, to learn that the Treasury Department lives hand-to-mouth and rarely has more than a couple weeks of cash on hand, if that. So the Treasury Department, in order to raise cash, will print up a stack of Treasury bonds, which are the means by which the U.S. government borrows money. A bond has a face value, which is the amount it will be sold for, and it has a stated rate of interest that it will pay to the holder. So if you bought a bond with $100 face value and that paid a rate of interest of 5%, then you'd pay $100 for this bond and you'd get $105 back in a year. Treasury bonds are sold regularly in auctions, and it's safe to say that the majority of these bonds are bought by big banks, such as those of China and Japan recently. At auction, the banks purchase these bonds, and then money gets sent into the Treasury coffers, where it can be dispersed for the usual array of government programs. Now, I promised you that I'd show you how money first comes into being. And so far, that hasn't happened, has it? The bonds are being bought with money that already exists in the banking system. Money is created by this next mechanism, where the Federal Reserve buys a treasury bond from a bank. When the Fed does this, they simply transfer money and the amount of the bond to the other bank and take possession of the bond. A bond is swapped for money. Now, where did this money come from? Glad you asked. It comes out of thin air as the Fed creates money when it buys this debt. 
New Fed money is always exchanged for debt. And so now we can put the title on this page. All dollars are loaned into existence. You don't believe me? Here's a quote from a Federal Reserve publication entitled, Putting It Simply. When you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover the check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. Wow, now that is an extraordinary power. Whereas you or I need to work to obtain money and place it at risk to have it grow, the Federal Reserve simply prints up as much as it wishes whenever it wants and then loans it to us all via the U.S. government with interest. Given the fact that over 3,800 paper currencies and a few metallic ones have been rendered worthless due to mismanagement, wouldn't it make sense to keep a very close eye on whether or not the Federal Reserve is acting responsibly? So now we know that there are two kinds of money out there. The first is bank credit, which is money that is loaned into existence, as we saw here. Bank credit is a type of money that comes with an equal and offsetting amount of debt associated with it, debt upon which interest must be paid. And the second type of money is printed out of thin air, and that's what you see right here at this stage. The process by which money is created is so simple that the mind is repelled. So don't worry if you need to review this chapter several more times. However, if you understood all that and get it, well, congratulations, give yourself a hand, because it's not easy. These monetary learnings allow us to formulate two more extremely important key concepts. The first is that all dollars are backed by debt. At the local bank level, all new money is loaned into existence. At the Federal Reserve level, money is simply manufactured out of thin air and then exchanged for interest-paying government debt. In both cases, the money is backed by debt, debt that pays interest. From this key concept, we can formulate a truly profound statement, which is that, at a minimum, each year, Enough new money must be loaned into existence to cover the interest payments on all of the past outstanding debt. If we flip this slightly, we can say that each year, all the outstanding debt must compound by at least the rate of interest on that debt. Each and every year, it must grow by some percentage. Because our debt-based money system is growing by some percentage continually, it is an exponential system by its very design. A corollary of this is that the amount of debt in the system will always exceed the amount of money in the system. I'm not going to cast judgment on this and say that it's good or bad. It simply is what it is. By understanding its design, though, you will be better equipped to understand that the potential range of future outcomes for our economy are not limitless, but rather bounded by the rules of the system, all of which leads us to the fourth key concept, which is that perpetual expansion is a requirement of modern banking. In fact, we can make a rule. Each year, new credit or loans must be made that at least equal the amount of all the outstanding interest payments that year. Without a continuous expansion of the money supply, past debts would not be able to be serviced and defaults would ripple through and possibly destroy the system. Defaults are the Achilles heel of a debt-based money system, which we saw in our local banking example in the previous chapter. Because of this, all the institutional and political forces in our society are geared towards avoiding this outcome. So the banking system must continually expand, not necessarily because it's the right or wrong thing to do, but rather simply because that is how it was designed. 
It's a feature of the system, just like using gasoline is a feature of my car's engine. I might wish and hope that my car would run on straw, but I'd be wasting my time because that's just not how it was designed. By understanding the requirement for continual expansion, we will be in a better position to make informed decisions about what's likely to transpire and take meaningful actions to enhance our prospects. So the key question is this. What happens when a human-contrived money system that must expand by its very design runs headlong into the physical limits of a spherical planet? One more belief of mine is that I will witness this collision in my adult lifetime, and in fact it may have already started, and I am extremely interested to see how this is all going to turn out. Now, this is admittedly a truly gigantic proposition to consider, and some would say that it's not very interesting at all, but rather it's just frightening. Well, if you want the future to look exactly like the past, then I suppose it is frightening. But if you are flexible in your view of the future, then you have an opportunity to make the most of whatever future actually arrives. These are fascinating, invigorating, and truly unprecedented times. And I am thrilled to be living right here, right now, with you. In the next section, we'll be looking at some very important historical context about our money system, where you'll learn that our money system could be viewed as a masterpiece of sophisticated evolution or as an historically brief experiment that is not yet 37 years old. Let's go. We've got one more key concept in front of us, and that's inflation. And then we're going to connect a few dots at the end. Most of us think of inflation as rising prices, but that's not quite right. Imagine if an apple and an orange are a dollar each one year, but ten dollars each next year. Since you enjoy eating apples and oranges the same in one year as the next, then the only thing that's truly changed here is your money, which has declined in value. Inflation is not caused by rising prices. Rising prices are instead a symptom of inflation. Inflation is caused by the presence of too much money in relation to goods and services. What we experience are things going up in price, but in fact inflation is really the value of your money going down, simply because there's too much of it around. Here's an example. Suppose you're on a life raft and somebody has an orange that they are willing to sell for money. Only one person in the raft has any money and that's a single dollar. So the orange sells for a dollar. But wait, just before it sells, you find a $10 bill in your pocket. Now, how much do you suppose the orange sells for? That's right, 10 bucks. It's still the same orange, right? Nothing about the utility or desirability of the orange has changed from one minute to the next. Only the amount of money kicking around in the raft. So we can make this claim. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. And what's true within a tiny life raft is equally true across an entire nation. Here, let me illustrate this point by using a long sweep of U.S. history. What we're looking at here is a graph of price levels in the United States that begins on the left in 1665 and progresses more than 300 years to 2008 on the right. But at this moment, only inflation over the period from 1665 to 1776 is marked on this chart. On the y-axis, what is being charted are price levels, not the rate of inflation. Now you might ask, how can we compare prices in 1665 to 2008? While there are some obvious liberties that have to be taken here, what is being compared are the basics of life. People ate food in 1665, just as they did later on. People had to transport themselves. They got educations, and they lived in houses in 1665, just as they did in 1776. So what is being compared is the relative cost of living in one period to the next. That is, inflation. In 1665, the basic cost of living was set to a value of 5. 
Now what is most striking about this chart to me is that from 1665 to 1776 there was absolutely no inflation. For 111 years a dollar saved was, well, a dollar saved. Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a world where you could earn a thousand dollars, put it in a coffee can in the backyard, and your great-great-grandchildren could dig it up and enjoy the same benefits from that thousand dollars as you would have 111 years previously. This isn't some fantasy from a cheap novella. This was reality in our country at one time. The country was on a gold and silver standard during this period and advanced tremendously while enjoying near-perfect price stability during times of peace. However, along comes a war, the Revolutionary War, and the country found itself unable to pay for the war with the gold and silver in the treasury. So a paper currency called Continentals was printed. And at first it was fully backed by a specified amount of real gold and silver in the treasury. But then the war proved to be more expensive than thought, and more and more of these were printed. Then the British, aware of the corrosive effects of inflation on society, started counterfeiting and distributing vast amounts of bogus continentals, and soon the currency began to collapse. Before long, massive inflation took hold. Seen on the inflation chart, the Revolutionary War took the general price level from a reading of 5 to a reading of 8. After the war, the paper continentals were utterly rejected by the people, who strongly preferred gold and silver. Most interestingly, price levels promptly returned back to the pre-war levels. The next serious bout of inflation was also associated with the war, again due to the overprinting of paper currency, and again, upon conclusion of the war, we saw a relatively prompt return of prices to the pre-war levels where they stayed for an additional 30 years. By now, we are nearly 200 years into this chart, and we find that the cost of living is roughly the same as it was in 1665. But then a war came along, the Civil War this time, and it was a doozy. To finance the war, the North had to resort to printing a type of currency that still lends its name to our own currency today. Of course, back then, it really did have a green back. Again, we see a rapid rise of inflation as a direct consequence of war, and again, a return to baseline after the crisis is over. We are now 250 years into this story, and the cost of living is still roughly the same as it was at the start. I invite you to think about that for a minute. But then another war came along, and this one was even bigger than any before, and again it was a highly inflationary event. And then another war, even bigger than any before it, which again proved inflationary, but this time, something odd happened. Inflation did not retreat before the next war began. Why? Two reasons. First, the country was no longer on a gold standard but instead a fiat paper standard administered by the Federal Reserve, and the populace did not have another form of currency to which it could turn. And second, because this was the first time that the war apparatus was not dismantled upon conclusion of hostilities. Instead, full mobilization was maintained and a protracted Cold War was fought, certainly as inflationary a conflict as any shooting war ever was. And now, if we look at the entire sweep of history, we can make an utterly obvious conclusion. All wars are inflationary. Why is this? Because any time the government engages in deficit spending, it creates the conditions for inflation. However, when the deficit spending is on legitimate infrastructure, such as roads or bridges or schools, that investment will slowly pay for itself by boosting productivity and paving the way for the creation of additional goods and services that will someday soak up the extra cash. Wars, however, are special. Vast quantities of money are spent on things that are meant to be blown up. The money stays at home while the goods get sent off to be blown up. When a bomb blows up, there's no residual benefit to the domestic economy later on. 
This means war spending is the most inflationary of all spending. It's a double whammy. The money stays behind working its evil magic while the goods it produced are destroyed. Heck, even if the goods aren't blown up, there's practically zero residual economic benefit to such specialized hardware, as amazing as that technology may be. For some reason, the most recent pair of wars have been presented by the U.S. mainstream press as being relatively pain-free for the average citizen, despite overwhelming historical odds to the contrary. In fact, on this 15-year-long chart of commodity prices, we observe that prices bounced in a channel, marked by the green lines, for more than 10 years. However, and hopefully by now unsurprisingly, shortly after the start of the Iraq War, commodity prices began marching higher and have inflated nearly 140% in five years. Your gasoline and food bills will confirm this. So if anybody tries to tell you that you haven't sacrificed for the war, let them know you sacrificed a large portion of your savings and your paycheck to the effort. Thank you very much. At any rate, back to our main story. Here's inflation between 1665 and 1975. Knowing what you now know about Nixon's actions on August 15, 1971, what do you suppose the rest of the graph looks like? between 1975 and today. This is your world. You've been living on the steeply rising portion of this graph for so long that it probably looks like level ground to you. Because inflation is now a permanent feature and because it advances at a percentage rate, your money is declining in value exponentially. That's what this hockey stick graph is telling you. What does it mean to live in a world where your money loses value exponentially? You know what it means because you live there. It means always having to work harder and harder just to stay in place. And it means perplexing and astoundingly risky investment decisions have to be made in an attempt to grow one's savings fast enough to avoid the ravages of inflation. It means two incomes are needed where one used to suffice and kids left at home while both parents work. A world of constantly eroding money is a devilishly complicated world to navigate and leaves scant room for error, especially for those without the appropriate means or connections. And it doesn't have to be this way, and indeed for the majority of our country's history, as you can see, it wasn't. And I'm hard-pressed to say that inflation is a necessity and serves some essential and greater good because a lot of progress and advancement happened between 1665 and 1940 without the benefit of perpetual inflation. To help put all of this in context, let's mark the moments when our country abandoned the gold standard, first internally and then completely. It may have surprised some of you, as it did me, to find out that inflation is not a mysterious law of nature like gravity, but rather an extremely well-characterized matter of policy. So now we have our fifth key concept. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Flipped a bit, we can say that inflation is a deliberate act of policy. Here's what one wag had to say about this matter. Paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value, zero. That was Voltaire in 1729. Of course, he was a bit too pessimistic in his assessment as this German woman proves by using her furnace to liberate the intrinsic heat content of paper money. John Maynard Keynes, the father of the branch of economics that utterly dominates our lives, had this to say about inflation. Lenin was certainly right. There is no more positive or subtle or sure means of destroying the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of the citizens. The process engages all of the hidden forces of economics on the side of destruction and does it in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose. Given that the destructive, corrosive effects of inflation are so well understood by the architects and the administrators of our monetary system, it's fair to wonder exactly what the plan here is. 
Now, finally, here in Chapter 10 of the Crash Course, we can string together these three very important dots. Number one, in 1971, the U.S., and by extension the world, terminated the last connection to a gold restraint, and federal borrowing turned the corner never to look back. Concurrently, the money supply turned the corner, piling up at a much faster rate than the growth of goods and services. And so we get to data point number three, which is that inflation is the fully predictable outcome of data points one and two. Boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. All connected, all saying the same thing, with profound implications for your future. Now, if you're of a mind that there's no reason that all three of these graphs cannot just continue to exponentially accelerate to ever higher amounts without end, then there's no point in watching the rest of the crash course. However, if you don't happen to believe that, then you're going to want to see the rest of this. There is literally nothing more important for you to be doing right now than gaining an understanding of how these pieces fit together assessing the risks for yourself, and taking actions to prepare for the possibility of a future that's substantially different from today. Now that we've covered compounding, money, and inflation, you have the tools to get the most from the remaining sections of the crash course. We have a few more dots to connect. Let's go. Holders of that debt don't get their money back. Boom! The claims get diminished. In this instance, if the future isn't large enough to pay back the claims, then defaults are simply a way of not paying them back. The inflation route can be confusing, so think of it this way. What if you sold your house to someone and elected to hold a note for $500,000? The terms call for the note to be repaid all at once in 10 years as a single payment of $650,000. Well, what if you get paid your $650,000? right on time, but that $650,000 will only buy this house. You got paid all right, but your claim on the future was vastly diminished by inflation. In the default scenario, your money is still worth something, but you don't get it back. In the inflation scenario, you get it back, but it hardly buys anything. In both cases, your future was diminished, so the impact is very nearly the same but the means of achieving it are wildly different. So the questions you need to ponder for yourself are, have too many claims been made on the future? And if so, will we face inflation or defaults as the means of squaring things up? You will arrive at wildly different life decisions depending on whether you answer yes or no to the first question and inflation or defaults to the second question so they are worth pondering. All right, here's what we learned. Key concept number six, debt is a claim on future human labor. Second, per capita debt has never been higher. We are in truly unprecedented territory in this country. Debt has increased by $16 trillion in the past five years, and most of it consumptive debt. This means that future consumption will have to be seriously curtailed or will enter a period of debt destruction, either by default or inflation. And finally, key concept number seven, our debt markets assume that the future will be much larger than the present. Our entire economic system, and by extension our way of life, is founded on debt. And debt is founded on the assumption that the future will always be bigger than the past. Therefore, it is utterly vital that we examine this assumption closely because if this assumption is false, so are a lot of other things we may be taking for granted. All right, we are done. I'll see you next time. Remember, a bubble exists when asset price inflation rises beyond what incomes can sustain. And that's exactly what we see in this chart. So where was the Fed during all of this? 
Well, they were busy writing research papers convincing themselves that there was no housing bubble, as seen in this 2004 Fed study entitled, Are Home Prices the Next Bubble? The main summary of the study started off on a good note, stating, Home prices have been rising strongly since the mid-1990s, prompting concerns that a bubble exists in this asset class and that home prices are vulnerable to a collapse that could harm the U.S. economy. But then the main conclusion of the paper veered sharply off into a ditch reading, A close analysis of the U.S. housing market in recent years, however, finds little basis for such concerns. The marked upturn in home prices is largely attributable to strong market fundamentals. Home prices have essentially moved in line with increases in family income and declines in nominal mortgage interest rates. Essentially moved in line with increases in family income? What? One of the most widely known facts of our time is that family incomes did not move up at all on an inflation-adjusted basis during the housing boom and is one of the principal economic failures of the first decade of the millennium. This just goes to show that the Federal Reserve is either stocked with inept or biased researchers and, of the two, I'm not sure which makes me feel worse about our chances of safely navigating through this mess. But the Fed's researchers were simply doing what millions of people did, namely falling prey to believing that somehow, this time it's different. But that's just how bubbles are. People take leave of their senses, use all manner of rationales to justify their positions, but then Suddenly, one day the illusion lifts, and what seemed to be unassailably true no longer makes any sense at all. Once that day happens, the fate of the bubble is reduced to measuring the speed of its collapse. While it's tempting to lay the blame for what's happening on the housing bubble, it's important to remember that the dramatic rise in house prices was itself just a symptom of a credit bubble run amok. Total credit at the end of 2000, when the stock bubble was bursting, stood at $27 trillion. By the end of 2007, it stood at an astounding $48 trillion. This $21 trillion increase in borrowing is five times larger than the increase in U.S. GDP over the same period of time. Any attempt to understand the housing bubble has to be viewed against the backdrop of this massive increase in debt. But as we noted in an earlier chapter, this credit bubble has been going on for 25 years. Unwinding a multi-generational debt binge is going to require some enormous changes in attitudes and habits. One reason that any bubble, but especially a housing bubble like this one, is so destructive is because so many bad investments are made along the way. Too many houses were built, too many shopping centers, and too many condos, and nearly all of them too large and ill-positioned for a future of expensive energy. Sorry to say, but all those trillions of dollars were wasted and worse, stole opportunities from the things that needed money more. The Austrian School of Economics has a very crisp and historically accurate definition of how a credit bubble ends. According to Ludwig von Mises, there is no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as a result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved.
This is a view I happen to ascribe to and explains my strong preference for placing my wealth out of the path of a potential dollar collapse. As a nation, we've undertaken desperate measures to avoid abandoning the continuation of our credit expansion, leaving a final catastrophe of the currency as our most likely outcome. As for the timing, it could hardly be worse. Dealing with a bursting housing bubble is hardly the sort of challenge we need at this particular moment in history, but here we are. The stewardship and vision displayed by the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C. in bringing all of this about has been utterly atrocious. So, what can we expect from a collapse in credit bubble? Simply put, everything that fed upon and grew as a consequence of too much easy credit will collapse. I am especially leery of financial stocks, low grade bonds, and of course, real estate. I see very few conventional ways to protect one's wealth, and so I invite you to begin asking yourself, and if you have one, your financial advisor, some very hard questions about the safety of your holdings. You'll be glad you did. Remember, this time it's probably not different. Please join us for the next chapter where we will explore the extent to which we have been telling ourselves pleasant half-truths and other falsehoods, which I call fuzzy numbers. Thank you for listening. Hello. Now, let's tie in inflation to the GDP story. The GDP you read about is always inflation-adjusted and reported after inflation is subtracted from it. This is called the real GDP while the pre-inflation adjusted number is called the nominal GDP. This is an important thing to do because GDP is supposed to measure real output, not the impact of inflation. Here's an example. If our economy consisted of producing lava lamps, and we produced one of them in one year, and one of them the next year, we'd want to record our GDP growth rate as zero, because our output is exactly the same in both years. So, if we sold a lava lamp for $100 one year, but $110 the next, we'd accidentally record a 10% GDP increase if we didn't back out the price increases. So, in this example, the real lava lamp economy has a value of $100, while the nominal lava lamp economy is $110. And because we're trying to measure the real economy, inflation must be removed from the picture. Ah, now we can begin to understand the second powerful reason that DC loves a low inflation reading. It's because GDP is expressed in real terms. It works like this. In the third quarter of 2007, it was reported that we experienced a very surprising and strong 4.9% rate of GDP growth. At the time, there were many proud officials declaring that certain tax cuts or these programs or whatnot were responsible for this excellent news. Less well reported was the fact that nominal GDP was 5.9%, from which was deducted the jaw-droppingly low inflation reading of 1%, giving us the final result of 4.9%. In order to believe this 4.9% figure, you have to first believe that our nation was experiencing a 1% rate of inflation during the same period that oil was first approaching $100 a barrel, and inflation was obviously and irrefutably exploding all over the globe. Lest you think I've cherry-picked an accidental, one-time, embarrassing, statistical BLS moment here, here's a chart of the so-called GDP deflator, which is the specific measure of inflation that is subtracted from nominal GDP to yield the reported real GDP. As you can see, for the past 15 quarters, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has been serenely and systematically subtracting lower and lower amounts of inflation, which simply flies in the face of both real-world inflation data and common sense. 
Remember, each percent that inflation is understated equals a full percent that GDP is overstated. If this is not lying to ourselves, then delusional is the next word that comes to my mind. If, instead, we make our own assumptions about inflation, or we use those of John Williams and subtract these from the reported GDP numbers, then we find that we've been in a solid recession for quite a while now. Ah, suddenly a lot of things that were difficult to understand make perfect sense. Contracting businesses, rising foreclosures, job losses, rising budget deficits, falling tax revenues, declining auto sales, all of these are consistent with recession and not expansion. The same sort of statistical wizardry that we've just explored here is performed on income, unemployment figures, house prices, budget deficits, and virtually every other government-supplied economic statistic you can think of. Each is laced with a long series of lopsided imperfections that inevitably paint a rosier picture than is warranted. We are now in the midst of a fearful credit crisis, a bursting bubble, and the first wave of boomer retirements, and solid, credible information is what we need as a beacon to find our way out. To close with Kevin Phillips again, our nation may truly regret losing sight of history, risk, and common sense. I couldn't agree more. Well, that's it for fuzzy numbers. Join me next time for peak oil and its relationship to our economic future. Something about what it does for us. We value any source of energy because we can harness it to do work for us. For example, every time you turn on a 100-watt light bulb, it is the same as if you had a fit human being in the basement pedaling as hard as they could to keep that bulb lit. That is how much energy a single light bulb uses. In the background, while you run water, take hot showers, and vacuum the floor, it is as if your house is employing the services of 50 such extremely fit bike riders. This slave count, if you will, exceeds that of kings in times past. It can truly be said that we are all living like kings. Although we may not appreciate that because it all seems so ordinary that we take it for granted sometimes. And how much work is embodied in a gallon of gasoline, our most favorite substance of them all? Well, if you put a single gallon in a car, drove it until it ran out, and then turned around and pushed that car home, you'd find out. It turns out that a gallon of gas has the equivalent energy of 500 hours of hard human labor, or 12 and a half 40-hour work weeks. So then how much is a gallon of gas worth, would we say? $4? $10? If you wanted to pay this poor man $15 an hour to push your car home, then we might value a gallon of gas at $7,500. Here's another example. It has been calculated that the amount of food that the average North American citizen consumes in a year requires the equivalent of 400 gallons of petroleum to produce and ship. 400 gallons of petroleum per person per year just for food. At $4 a gallon, that works out to $1,600 of your yearly food bill being spent on fuel, which doesn't sound too extreme. However, when we consider that those 400 gallons represent the energy equivalent of 100 humans working year-round at 40 hours a week, then it takes on an entirely different meaning. This puts your diet well out of the reach of most kings of times past. Just to put this in context, as it is currently configured, Food production and distribution uses fully two-thirds of our domestic oil production. This is one reason why a cessation of imports would be, shall we say, disruptive. Besides the way that oil works tirelessly in the background to make our lives easy beyond historical measure, oil is a miracle in other ways. 
In this picture, a typical American family was asked to cart out onto their front lawn everything in their house that was derived from oil. That's quite a sight. How easily could we replace the role of oil in our style of consumer-led, growth-based economy? Not very. We currently use oil mainly for transportation, sitting right at around 70% of all oil consumption. The next biggest block is for industrial purposes, followed by residential, which means heating oil. This last tiny little sliver, that's oil used to generate electricity. With the exception of biofuels, which I'll get to later, all renewable energy resources either provide heat or electricity, meaning that even if we entirely replaced all of the electricity and heat currently provided by oil with renewables, we'd only be addressing these tiny slices right here. And in the industrial processes, oil is the primary input feedstock to innumerable necessities of life, such as fertilizer, plastics, paint, synthetic fibers, chemical processes, and flying around. When we consider other potential fuel sources, we find that they are mostly incapable of fulfilling these needs. Biofuels and coal could potentially fill some of these functions, but certainly not without a massive reinvestment program, and not anytime soon. So let's review a few key facts. You have to find oil before you can produce it. And key fact number one here is that world oil discoveries peaked in 1964. U.S. discoveries peaked in 1930, and 40 years later, production peaked. We are now 44 years after the global discovery peak. That's a fact. Key fact number two is that world production of conventional crude has been flat for the past four years, even as prices have increased by 140%. Taken together, key facts number one and number two suggest the possibility that peak oil is already upon us. If true, then we are going to wish with all our hearts that we had begun preparing for this moment a decade or more ago. Key fact number three is that U.S. oil imports are the energy equivalent of more than 750 nuclear power plants, which is seven times as many nuclear plants as currently exist here, and nearly twice the total number of nuclear plants in the entire world. Key concept Number nine of the crash course, then, is that peak oil is a well-defined process that is nothing more than a physical description of how oil fields age. We have literally thousands of studied examples under our belts, and this is not open to debate. Only when the peak might arrive is up for discussion. Mostly hidden from us in plain sight is key concept number 10. The amount of work that oil performs for you is equivalent to having hundreds of slaves. It is this work that makes our lives what they are, staggeringly comfortable by historical standards. The average middle class life in Western society today would be the envy of most kings in times past. Key concept number 11 is that oil is a magical substance of finite supply but unlimited importance. This cannot be overstated. Transitioning from one fuel source to another is a devilishly expensive proposition, posing enormous challenges with respect to cost, scale, and time. Our species transitioned over many years from wood to coal because coal was a better fuel source. And we transitioned over several decades from coal to oil for the same reason. Nobody has been able to advance any candidates as our next source of energy. Technology is not a source of energy. It may help us to exploit our energy more efficiently, but it would be a big mistake to confuse technology with an energy source. And finally, what we need to keep a careful eye out for is the supply of oil being exceeded by demand. And this raises key concept number 12. Oil exports are being hit two ways, by rising demand and declining production. 
This raises the prospect that the moment when the world's nations finally realize there's not enough oil to supply everybody may come much sooner than most suspect. Exponential functions are hard for most humans to grasp, and oil exports are being exponentially squeezed in two directions, subjecting them to a surprisingly high rate of decline. And this completes an immensely brief tour through peak oil. If you've not already done so, you owe it to yourself to become knowledgeable on this subject due to its unequaled importance. I have links of plenty on the essential books, essential articles, and resources pages of my site. In the next section, we will discuss the intersection between energy and the economy. And I will make the point that it was no accident that our exponential debt-based money system grew up at precisely the same moment that a new source of high quality energy was discovered that proved capable of increasing exponentially right alongside it. Please join me as I explore the importance of energy to our particular economic and monetary systems in Chapter 17b, Energy Economics. Thank you for your attention. Instead, we're going to focus on how much energy it takes to get energy, because as I'm going to show you, that is what really matters. Fortunately, the concept's easy, and it's called net energy. The way we're going to measure this is by dividing the amount of energy we get by the amount of energy we had to use in order to get that energy. Energy out over energy in. Energy in is the tax, while the energy out is your take-home pay. Imagine that if the total energy it took to get an oil well drilled was one barrel of oil and 100 barrels was found. We'd say that our net energy return was 100 to 1. In this example, the tax we paid out was 1 out of 100, or 1%. Another phrase for this that you may encounter is energy returned on energy invested, which goes by the acronym EROEI. We're just going to stick with energy out divided by energy in for this section, or net energy, as it's easier to visualize and it's essentially the same thing. Now, let's make this visual by graphically comparing the relationship between energy out and energy in. The red part is the amount of energy we have to put in, and the green part is how much we got out, or the net energy. And we're displaying them such that they always sum to 100%. In this first scenario, the energy out divided by energy in yields a value of 50, meaning that one unit of energy was used to find and produce 50 units of energy. In other words, 2% was used to find and produce energy, leaving us a net 98% to use however we see fit. We could also call this part the surplus energy available to society. Even at a net energy ratio of only 15, the surplus energy available to society remains quite high. This surplus energy, of course, is what supports all of our economic growth our technological progress, and our wonderfully rich and complicated society. Now, I want to draw your attention to what happens over here on this part of the chart between the readings of 10 and 5. The net energy available to society begins to drop off in a manner that should be familiar to you after seeing the section on exponential charts. Only this hockey stick points down. Below a reading of 5, and the chart heads down in earnest, hitting zero when it gets to a reading of one. When it takes one unit of energy to get a unit of energy, there is zero surplus, and there's really no point in going through the trouble of getting it. Below a reading of five, we are on the energy cliff. To find out why this is an enormously important chart, let's look at our experience with net energy with respect to oil. In 1930, for every barrel of oil used to find oil, it is estimated that 100 were produced, giving us a reading of 100 to 1, which would be way off this chart to the left. By 1970, 
fields were a lot smaller and the oil often deeper or otherwise trickier to extract, and the net energy gain was now down to a value of 25 to 1. Still a very good return with lots of green beneath it. By the 1990s, this trend continued with oil fines returning somewhere between 18 and 10 to 1. And today, it is estimated that recent oil fines are returning only 3 to 1 net energy. Why is this net yield dropping? Because in the past, a relatively small amount of energy was required to create the metal for a smallish rig, and the fines were massive and plentiful and relatively shallow. Today, much more energy is required to find energy. Exploration ships and rigs are massive. If we put our humble 1930s rig to scale, it looks like this. And today, more wells are being drilled to greater depths to find and produce smaller and smaller fields, all of which weigh upon our net energy return. And what about the allegedly massive amounts of oil contained within the so-called tar sands and oil shales, the ones that are often described as equivalent to several Saudi Arabias? The net energy values for these are especially poor and in no way comparable to the 100 to 1 returns found in Saudi Arabia. Further, the water and environmental costs associated with them are disturbingly high. And what about renewable energy sources? Methanol, which can be made from biomass, sports a net energy of about 3, while biodiesel offers a net energy return of somewhere around 2. Corn-based ethanol, if we're generous, might produce a net energy return of just slightly over 1, but could also be negative according to some sources. If we add in all the other new sources for usable liquid fuels that we just talked about, we see that they are all somewhere on the face of the cliff. Unless we very rapidly find ways of boosting the net energy of these options, we'll simply find far less surplus energy for our basic needs and discretionary wants. Solar and wind are both capable of producing pretty high net returns but these are producing electricity, not liquid fuels, for which we already have an extensive investment in distribution and use. Oh, and by the way, where's the so-called hydrogen economy on this chart? Right here. Because there are no hydrogen reservoirs anywhere on Earth, every single bit of it has to be created from some other source of energy at a loss. In other words, hydrogen is an energy sink. In creating hydrogen, we always lose energy. And that's not pessimism. That's the law. The second law of thermodynamics, to be exact. Because hydrogen is a carrier of energy, not a source, it is more accurately described like this, a battery. Now. To make an absurd argument, because nobody would be this foolish, suppose Congress made the decision to, say, try and run our society on corn-based ethanol. What could we expect there? Well, if we adjust our graph to reflect that decision, we'll see a whole lot of red and very little green. The tax is very high, while our take-home pay is very low. By way of commentary, I find it somewhat telling that out of all the possible alternative energy sources, this is the one that Congress chose to advance. I mean, short of directly launching barrels of oil into outer space, it's hard to imagine a much more foolish idea. The important point here, though, is that even if the government completely subsidized ethanol to the point that it only cost you a penny a gallon to buy, we would soon find ourselves ruined. And the reasons why have already been covered. With less surplus energy, less societal complexity is possible. Under an ethanol regime, we'd find that many cherished job positions would simply vanish. Regulatory compliance specialists for food additives would have to revert to being farmers. Pediatric radiological oncologists would become uh, healers. 
and Midwest Regional Communications Coordinators for Special Olympics would um, have to find something else to do, and so on. If we tried to live on ethanol as a liquid fuel, we'd quickly lose nearly all of the specialized jobs that we associate with modern society because there would be practically no surplus energy to use in support of that complexity. This diagram with a rich balance of reinvested and consumed energy would rapidly become this. Because of their low net energy, ethanol and other such poor energy sources are thoroughly incompatible with our current lifestyles. This turns into this. So let's review the two key concepts so far before moving on. Number 13, the price of energy is irrelevant. Net energy is everything. On this basis, both corn-based ethanol and hydrogen are dismal failures. Key concept number 14, social complexity is built upon surplus energy. If we want to maintain our society in its current form, we're going to have to master this concept and fast. Now, on to chapter 17c. Okay, now we are finally ready to marry the economy to energy. In a recent interview, Peter Schiff of Euro-Pacific Capital described economics as the science of satisfying unlimited demand with limited resources. Given our druthers, most humans would choose to live the life of a billionaire, but this is clearly not possible, even with our current massive abundance of surplus energy. Luckily for us, we've had massive amounts of surplus energy to work with over the past hundred years. And here's where the story gets really interesting. Remember all these exponential graphs? In theory, there's nothing problematic with living in a world full of exponential growth and depletion curves, as long as the world does not have any boundaries. However, exponential functions take on enormous importance when they approach a physical boundary, as seems to be the case for oil in the very near future. Both discoveries and production indicate that we could be at oil's exponential boundary already. Population, money, and oil demand are all exhibiting exponential behavior. Of the three, we can make a very strong case that both population and our money system are utterly dependent on the continued expansion of oil energy. And here are the questions that arise from that line of thinking. What if our exponentially based economic and monetary systems, rather than being the sophisticated culmination of human evolution, are really just an artifact of oil? What if all of our rich societal complexity and all of our trillions of dollars of wealth and debt simply are the human expression of surplus energy pumped from the ground. It's an interesting thought. More immediately, you and I would be perfectly within our rights to wonder what will happen when, not if, but when oil begins to decline. What will happen to our exponential debt-based money system during this period? Is it even possible for it to function in a world without constant growth? These are important questions and they deserve serious answers. And by placing oil consumption on a 4,000 year timeline, all sorts of troubling questions pop up when we overlay the population curve on top of it. Together, these graphs say that we might want just a little dose of adult size planning to go with our usual election year hoopla. Central banking just happened to come into maturity coincident with an exponentially exploitable energy source and became all powerful and revered within a very short period of time. Fiat money systems have come and gone, but this one had a trillion barrel energy tailwind that is about to turn into a headwind. Distributing ever larger shares of money during a period of constant growth is a pleasant job that enjoys broad political and popular support. Operating in a world of declining energy 
is an utterly new prospect for every single political and financial institution. And so now it is up to us, you and me, to wonder what we should expect in the future from a money system whose most very basic assumption of them all might be an error. What if the assumption that the future will not just be bigger, but exponentially bigger than the present, is incorrect? This assumption is on full display in the debt chart of the U.S. as compared to GDP. The red circle betrays a profound belief that the future will be much, much larger than the present. Consider that the total economy of the U.S. is only some $14 trillion, while the total credit market debt of the U.S. is more than $49 trillion. Lop off a few zeros and round things off, and this is the exact same thing as a bank loaning $500,000 for a home against a salary of $140,000. If we knew that the current tax bracket of the borrower was going to double and then triple again, would this be a good loan to make? To our nation, the end of cheap oil means a sustained and permanent reduction in our after-tax take-home pay. My question is, who in the right mind loans more and more money to someone whose earnings are all but guaranteed to decline? Here's how it all sums up for me. There are some knowns. We know that energy is the source for all growth and complexity. 